This episode of the Beancast is brought to you by Artisanal Agency, the exclusive representative of the This Week in Tech podcast network. Reach twit.tv's tech-savvy, affluent, highly engaged audience by booking your campaign now. Visit artisanalagency.com to find out more. Bandwidth provided by Recursive Squirrel Interactive. Visit them on the web at recursivesquirrel.com. Episode 566, Satan Shack. Monday, November 3rd, 2019. It's time for this week's edition of The Beancast, a weekly discussion about the news and issues facing marketers today. I'm your host, Bob North. Thanks for joining us. In the midst of the press lambasting Facebook for their hands-off policy regarding political ads, Twitter announced that they were simply banning political advertising altogether from their platform. So is the ban a great idea or a total cop-out? Tonight we'll discuss. Also the implicit bias in influencer marketing, the transparency blame game, reversing the widespread hatred of advertising, plus this week's fair, fail, foul. That's the lineup. Let's meet tonight's panel. Thanks for joining us for this week's Beancast. I'm Bob Norp, and with me on the panel for this evening, we start with production consultant to the stars of marketing, at least, the founder of the Antipodean, Ms. Michelle Excel. Michelle, welcome back. Hi, Bob. So good to be back. And it's still actually sunny in San Francisco, so I've got a very nice view during the oh, podcast today. You're making me jealous. San Francisco is a beautiful place. I would love to be there right now. <laughs> Now, next up, she's a speaker, she's a writer, she's a consultant, and she's changing the way brands and individuals approach their promotional tactics. The founder of The Red Thread, Ms. Tamsin Webster. Hi, Tamsin. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm well. Excellent. And you know, it's dark and cold here in Boston. But, you know, <laughs> it's nice and dark here, I can pretend I'm too. in San Francisco. <laughs> it's nice and dark in New York as well. Now, also with us, we have the undisputed king of podcasting measurement and analysis, the SVP of strategy and marketing at Edison Research, Mr. Tom Webster. Hi, Tom. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me back on this, my 100th show with the Beancast. You're kidding. It's been 100? No, it hasn't been 100. (laughs) I know that. And finally, we have the man who's causing the entire ad industry to take a second look at the power of television, the co-founder and lead analyst of TV Rev, Mr. Alan Walk. Alan, hi. Hey, how are you doing, Bob? It, it is also cold and dark here in New York. So. <laughs> I know, we're both that way. Well, let's jump right into the topics. And first up, Twitter took a dramatic and some might even say controversial approach to political advertising this past week. And they completely banned it from their platform, uh, which is markedly different from what Facebook has been doing. Now, some called it brave. uh, Quite a few called it brave, in fact. Some called it cowardly. uh, Quite a few called it cowardly. And some simply called it disingenuous, which is more where I'm following. But, Tom, take us through the ramifications of this decision. Is this ultimately a positive or a negative move for the sake of political discourse online? You know, I, I, I think it's disturbing. I think is where I come down on this. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I, I want to go deep on this if if we can, because you know, my company does the exit polls for the networks, and so we're you know very embedded and engrossed in political discourse in my company. Uh, I mean, ultimately, this in the short term, you know, it's a it's a PR move for Twitter. It's a way to position themselves as the not Facebook. But stepping back from all of this in the in the big picture, what I see here are two significant media publishers and platforms, but certainly publishers too, in Twitter and Facebook, that are making these decisions on their own. And it's highlighting to me the fact that neither one of these massive tech giant platforms are under any kind of regulation by something like the FCC, which does exist for a reason, no matter how uh, anarchist you might be. 
you know, so things like radio and television, there are some defined rules about uh, about political discourse on those channels and what can and can't be restricted. And all of this writ large to me is basically these two large tech platforms saying, actually, we make our own rules here. And that to me is 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 kind of disturbing. And especially when you think about what, like, how do you define what a political ad is? And, you know, and Twitter's made a statement there. And ultimately, in the two different stances, Facebook saying, look, you know, we don't care, we'll take it. And Twitter saying, we won't take ads from candidates and we won't take ads on these certain issues. That to me is actually the more disturbing take of the two. Um, I'm not so sure I agree with that. I mean, it's just, if any TV station wants to ban p political advertising from their station, they're allowed to do that. If any network wants to do that, they're allowed to do that. I but mean, it's, yeah, it's more than that, Bob. It's, it's, they have, they have organizations that vet the ads, right? So at TV networks, you can't run false advertising on them. That's something you have all, all Facebook and Twitter. Oh, you know Twitter what? Do. I mean, it's just like the Willie Horton ad got ran, ran. You know what I mean? It's just like but, it's. Yeah, but, there, but there's, there's, there's a big difference. Be, yeah, but there's a, and there's a big difference between that and a lot of the stuff that's showing up on Facebook, whose only, whose only check is, you know, it doesn't meet the graphic standards. Is, it, is the JPEG the right size? Right. Right. And so it was interesting. Some a well-known tech journalist had approached me and a number of people that I know because they wanted to do a story about whether, with all of the you know sort of advanced TV now, someone could pull a Cambridge Analytica type thing using television. And the short answer is probably not because one, it would be incredibly expensive. TV is much more expensive than social media. And also because most of the major networks, you know, cable and broadcast, have somebody looking at the ads before they let them go on the air. And that's because, as, as Tom was mentioning, they're, you know, they're regulated by the FCC. Now, what's funny is that all started because they didn't want Coke to run ads that say that Pepsi makes your teeth fall out. But, you know, it applies to politics as well. Well, I, me, cer I, I certainly, I, well, I, just one second. I, I certainly agree with both of you in terms of the fact that it, it's, it's unfortunate and problematic that they're not being regulated in their, in their, the way that they do political advertising. I think that that's a problem. But the, the Twitter case of them you know, banning political ads, as much as I disagree with it, in principle, I can't say that it's wrong. I mean, I can't say that it's even troubling. It's it's more that it's it's just plain cowardice in a lot of ways. So but, here's why it's it's wrong and troubling and troublingly wrong, and okay. disturbingly troubling. Uh, <laughs> if they if they had just stopped at uh, we will not take ads or ad money from political candidates, full stop. That's their that's their prerogative. They they could do that, right? And you're right. Nobody has to take those ads. Um, however, that's not where they stop. What they also took into account were things like what super PACs spend tons of money on, uh, on television especially, which are not candidate ads, but issue ads. But they are issue ads that point to either the Republican or the Democratic candidate. And they listed a few specific things that they call political in nature. So if I were to put an ad on Twitter against climate change, which is specifically mentioned as a political issue, number one, that in itself is a political stand that it is a political issue. Some might say it's not a political issue. But let's say, OK, fine. So Twitter is banning ads that are supporting the stopping of climate change. Right. What is the opposite of that ad? Now, no one's taking out ads that say uh, we should burn the planet to the ground. Right. Let's light all the fires. This is fine. No one's taking those ads out. But the opposite of the let's prevent climate change paid ad is the paid ad for Exxon Mobil, is the paid ad for Ford Motor Company, is the paid ad for all the things that are contributing to an environmental collapse. So there's no fair exchange here that in, in that they are making this statement about these quote unquote political things like immigration and climate change. They are in fact making a political stand. Well, and also if you take into account the number of things now that people are making political, whether or not they are, I mean, sometimes the whether or not something's political is a, is a, is a personal opinion. I mean, I don't think it's a personal opinion when you look at how ESPN, for instance, has just not been covering the issue with the NBA and China because mm. they're saying it's political, but it's basketball, right? And so I think I think it's a really slippery slope that, frankly, 
both networks, both Facebook and Twitter, have taken an overly simplistic and frankly lazy approach to saying, you know, and I think frankly it was it was more motivated by trying to show the other one up about the right way to be than by actually thoughtful, considered uh, uh, thinking about thoughtful thinking, uh, <laughs> uh, contemplation about what it actually means long term, and that these these are much stickier, much more complicated topics than just an outright ban or an outright we're going to let everything run uh, would indicate. I think. I've got another theory as well. I do I do agree that this is an overly simplistic reaction. Absolutely. That this is far more nuanced than this and it should have taken them far more long far longer and uh, much more than a series of tweets to announce this. I mean, I know that there was more in terms of actual policy, but um, it seemed overly simplistic. Uh, my first gut reaction was they have done this to protect normal advertising revenue. So uh, so as to not say, annoy or piss off uh, either side uh, and perhaps brands that would have an allegiance with either political party. And I know that maybe it's not the answer to everything, but it's it's certainly suspect when I think in um, in the initial series of tweets when when it was announced, when Jack announced, uh, you know, there's there's a, uh, one of his one of his tweets starts, you know, while Internet advertising is incredibly powerful and very effective for commercial advertisers, it is, and then he goes on to talk about the risk with politics. So, you know, they're very much protecting their ad interests. Um, that was just one thing that I thought anyway. Uh, and also I think it's, it, you know, it, it you can't draw the line between paid advertising and organic and earned reach because as we saw in so much of the 2016 election, not just that, but everything that's been blowing up in the last sort of five years, um, earned reach, uh, is is it doesn't have to be paid to be influential and a and lot of that, accounts are creating content that is highly inflammatory and, and that's highly, my uh, yeah, that, that's the that's, that's the heart and, of my yeah, that's the heart of my issue at, Bob. yeah exactly. because i'm like they're not it, stopping any of that right they're not coming down as content police they're coming down as paid advertising police right that, it, the, my, my reaction was to, to protect their ad uh, revenue interests they're they're, they're basically they're, just saying you know that we're not going to take money for this we're not going to take and i i don't see anything wrong with that except that it's it's kind of ignoring the bigger issue which is the fact that their platform is filled with these issues already i mean they've got accounts that are spilling these so, you know, spewing all they're these. They're not pinned. They're not pinned to make sure that certain people that look a certain way, at least as far as the algorithm concerned is concerned, sees it. So I, to me, that's the. I mean, that is that to me is the fundamental difference. I'm like, yeah, I can choose to not follow. I can choose to turn off feed. I can choose to mute words. In fact, even on Facebook. But journalists um, can still promote but, their yeah. articles, political articles. I mean, journalists but, and publications can still promote their their thought pieces on these issues. It's just that the political ads are not being disseminated. So, you know, yeah, and, and sorry, and, and if you think of the way that people use Twitter versus Facebook, right? Twitter is a public platform, so much of what people see is something that was put out there for public consumption. On Facebook, it's generally your, you know, people's friends' vacation photos or whatnot, plus these paid ads. And the paid ads are really the way that things, you know, that any sort of public content gets in there. And then that may get shared by people or commented or show up in your feed, but it's a very different than Twitter, where exactly what you guys were saying was is happening. That Michelle was saying that you know it's all coming from you know from these accounts, not really from pay, from advertising that people you know sort of look at and go, oh yeah, it's an ad, but there's there's enough other crap on there, and it gets retweeted and reshared and Facebook and Twitter's algorithms are constantly putting stuff in there that like three people that you that your friends follow like this. So, you know, you can't even stop it. I continue to be, tr I continue to be troubled by the, the issue ad aspect of this, but, uh, but I will say this not to argue against myself. Uh, and, and Bob, you want some advanced pollster analytics here? I'm going to go deep. Here's okay. some advanced pollster analytics. Uh, O'Rourke spent about a million dollars on Twitter. Donald Trump spent a little over $6,000 on Twitter. So about a million compared to 6,000. And O'Rourke is now out of the race. So sample of two advanced analytics, Twitter ads kill you. <laughs> I don't know that I can make that conclusion, but I can certainly make the conclusion that Twitter ads are not nearly as influential as we think that they are. Well, Which... it's correlation, and you know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. 
Well, you know, one of the big f- side circuses going on this week was that big contrast between Facebook's policy and the Twitter policy and the war of words between the two of them and all the stuff we're going to talk a little bit later about um, about Mark Zuckerberg's, uh, you know, ongoing demise with all this political uh, all the political blowback from his policy. But what I'm wondering what I'm wondering from the panel is, is this argument between Twitter and Facebook just a circus and it has no meaning whatsoever? Or is there a real definitive difference between the two platforms and that one of them is actually doing something right? Um, I, I'm not sure that either, any of us can come down on the side of either platform, but I'm just going to leave it up to the panel. I mean, um, Alan, you want to go first? Uh, what, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, at least Twitter is taking us, you know, trying to do something. I mean, obvi- you know, at some level, it's not really a whole lot, you know, because it's the the Twitter ads are not how much of the fake stuff on Twitter happens, but um, at least at least the 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 optics are good. Whereas Facebook refusing to fact check anything is is incredibly troubling, given the size of their audience and given their influence outside of the United States too, where you know people are getting killed because of shit that's on Facebook. Oh, so and um because of people are getting killed because of things that are on Facebook and you know and and they do nothing to stop it. Um, so but you know, there's no. Again, so go ahead, go is that ahead. That's their responsibility, Michelle. though. Yeah, is that yes, their it is. It is. It is. Okay, it I, is. I they are a they are a media outlet, and they need to be governed the same way as a media outlet. He needs to stop pretending that it's a social network. It's a media outlet. Well, and, an and regardless of how you want. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. It's 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 an ad platform for sure. I mean, the media outlet side of it. I mean, I see Twitter as a place where more people go to get their news. And you may be saying that, you know, what they're doing now is is going some way to making them more, you know, uh, getting rid of a lot more of the, the the false information. But I mean, Facebook have also just brought out the fact checking. I'm not I'm not in favor of Facebook or Twitter. I think they both have enormous issues and that's an, another whole podcast all on its own and lack total lack of of regulation absolutely comes into that the fact that there is no fcc fcc or you know oversight or anything like that is massive and they're they're skirting that right now um and will continue to because it seems like nobody really wants to to jump in and start to regulate that but you know facebook um i do see now i have a lot of family members, I hate to admit this, who I've found out recently in recent years um, are part of sharing those inflammatory, completely flagrantly false um, content pieces that are going around. And now I see them post them and underneath it has sort of related articles or says that this article that this person from my network has shared uh, is very possibly from a site that we have deemed to be a, a totally uh, inaccurate, like a, a non-fact, basically saying, watch out, this is fake news. So I'm seeing that on a personal basis on my own Facebook. And I'm not seeing things like that on Twitter. I'm not as much of a Twitter person. I'm more Facebook because that's internationally, I stay in touch with people. Um, but they both have their issues, and I think that they're both taking steps to do something about it, but the platforms themselves are never going to fix themselves. I think it's up to to us, and I don't know if just vote, you know, voting with our removal of ourselves from the platforms, you know, um, I don't think that's necessarily going to do anything. I think we have to decide, you know, whether we want to keep them in our lives, uh, and if we do, what are we willing to put up with, um, and what are we not? And if we're not, how do we move to force them to regulate? I mean... Yeah, that is, it's, it's yeah, that assumes, issue. and that assumes that societies are very good self-regulators, and they are provably not. No. I mean, humans are terrible self-regulators, and I think in both cases, the argument seems to be, well, people will figure it out. Actually, no, they won't. It's like <laughs> left unregulated from the outside. It's why governments exist. It's why regulations exist. Is that left on their own? This there will always be people, and this is true whether it's people or any other kind of system. There will always be somebody who finds the cheat in the system. They find the cheat code in the system. That that the systems unregulated allow for bad actors. Period. And there is no such thing as a positive self-regulation of the system. That doesn't happen unless there's an outside force. <laughs> and so the the biggest argument that Facebook puts out there is that oh well, people will figure it out. No, they freaking won't. That's not how it works. That's not how yeah. people work. And that's to me what I you know I was saying earlier that it's overly simplistic and frankly dangerous is the fact that they're saying, well, you know, and lazy because they're saying, well, you know, people are smart, they'll figure it out. People are smart, but s- taken together, 
a collection of people really, really freaking dumb. And they're also yeah. structurally they're structurally set up in uh, you know to to think differently than uh, a, a, you know a media organization perhaps should because it, what they reward in their hiring processes you know all, for all of the the the, the tech behemoths here uh, are you know your ability to solve a quadratic equation, but where's the chief ethicist? Where's the ombudsman with power? Uh, where you know where is where is the person sitting in that organization? tasked with ethics well that's the problem that's, that's the problem with all of advertising i mean we've brought that up on the show many times that the advertising has no ethics uh, to speak of i mean we have no ethical board that reviews us that guides us that teaches us i mean doctors and lawyers as much as lawyers are denigrated in our society have to go through ethics reviews they uh, to keep their law license they have to go through this and maybe advertising should be under that same kind of restriction as should tech. I mean, some of the work that I'm doing right now with TEDx Cambridge is with with a with a woman who's a philosopher who's arguing that philosophers and ethicists need to be on you know as equal a member of teams on at tech companies um, for these very reasons because technologists, engineers, uh, which is basically advertisers, whatever, this is not what their training is. But ethicists and philosophers, their training is in asking the hard questions, getting to those deeper layers, so you don't get these overly simplistic answers. And I think that's what's actually necessary. But again, humans left to their own devices will always go for the simpler answer. It, it is how we're wired. It is how we work. Um, but this is where we have to take the harder step of saying, we need to do something different because there, there isn't a simple answer here. And so let's find the best answer instead. Well, we're going to move on in just a second and talk about the implicit bias in influencer marketing as if we didn't already know that there was one. We'll get to that in just a minute. But first, I want to talk about our sponsor for this evening. Okay, this one is for the brands out there, whether you're a big brand, whether you're a small brand, whether you're a media buyer out there working for one of these brands. I've got a great way to connect with arguably the best technology-minded audience available today because our sponsor, Artisanal Agency, is the exclusive representative for Twit.tv, one of the most prestigious tech podcasting networks out there. And they want to help you reach their extremely lucrative listeners. And I'm telling you, I should know a little bit about this because I am a listener. I am a huge fan of this network. I listen to MacBreak Weekly, iOS Today, and of course, I listen to This Week in Tech, one of the longest running and best tech podcasts out there. And that's just three of their amazing shows because they have many more. Windows Weekly, um, uh, Tech News Today, all these great shows. And I buy stuff from all their ads, uh, not all their ads, but a lot of their ads. I'd be, very, I'd be very poor if I bought something from all their ads. But I do buy stuff from their ads all the time because their live reads are phenomenal. And listen to these numbers, uh, 50 million downloads a year, 70% of the audience directly works in tech, and 82% of the audience say that they have bought a product directly as a result of a twit.tv ad recommendation. And let's focus on that last point. Let's, not make, let's make sure we don't forget this, because they are offering an actual live read recommendation here. And they take that responsibility very seriously. Not just anyone can advertise on twit.tv because Artisanal Agency will carefully vet each sponsor so that their tech journalist hosts can offer your brand a wholehearted recommendation while you, as the buyer, can relax knowing there won't be any brand safety issues about running next to somebody who's maybe unseemly or who you didn't expect to run next to. Now, whether you're coming with a completely baked campaign or need everything from graphics to ad copy help, Artisanal Agency offers a hands-on approach. They ensure your campaign will run seamlessly. They will handle the onboarding. They will handle the delivery of creative assets. They will even monitor your ad reads to make sure that you're getting the full value of every single ad buy. Now, I want you to reach out to them today just to find out more information or to start your campaign if you'd like, if you're ready to go on the twit.tv network. All you have to do is visit artisanalagency.com, that's artisanalagency.com to find out more, or email hello at artisanalagency.com. Start your next podcast ad campaign with a show from Twit, and we thank them very much for their support of our show, The Beancast. Well, as if influencer marketing didn't have enough bad press of late, 
<laughs> they've got a lot of bad stories we've covered over the last few weeks. Now the tactic is facing criticism about its implicit bias problem. Now, brands love to showcase their products being sported in exotic locales by insta-famous individuals, but the problem is these people are almost always white and blonde, as the article points out that I'm referencing here. Tamson, is this an issue that's surmountable through making more considered decisions as marketers, or is, is this just an endemic problem of the influencer space that really needs to be reworked from the ground up in terms of the structure of, of these networks? Uh, yes to both. Uh, I mean, I think <laughs> that in a lot of ways, this is a continued rant from the, the previous topic, which is that left on its own, like a, a system is going to reflect its its contents, right? So Tom and I were talking about this earlier, and as he wisely said, I mean, social media is a mirror. And the thing is, is that it's going to be a mirror of the implicit bias that we see largely lar in, in larger society in general. And so without conscious efforts to counteract what is already present, then we are going to repeat and amplify those biases that are already there. So yes, it's endemic, um, but it doesn't mean that it can't be fixed. I mean, like I said, this is, this is, this is the role of you know, either regulation or uh, conscious decision making from marketing departments, from businesses to say, okay, the data may say that people respond better to these ads that feature these kinds of people. But the problem is people actually aren't always right. And I know that sounds strange when you say like, well, the data says people that, but people will like what they, is familiar to them. And what's pro what the problem that's happening more widely in society is that we are not putting unfamiliar faces, body types, genders, orientations, ethnicities, all of that, we're not putting them in front of people. So because it's unfamiliar, it's not liked as much. And so it's really up to us, in my opinion, that either by choice or by regulation, we need to go against what the current data says people like, so that we take a stand, put more of that out there, so that eventually the data, ca the, the data and society catches up. My question is, who goes first? I mean, you know, it, it really comes down to it's not just data. It's, it, it's not just the, the wide ranging survey data about what people prefer. It's the hard data of what gets the response. And if these ads are generating better response, I mean, what, how, do, how do we fix that as a, as a society? That seems like it's a societal problem that needs a to company, be fixed, well, which company, is acceptance of decide, different ethnicities. needs to decide what kind of company is it and what does it stand for. I mean, because if you, if you, if you to me, you cannot simultaneously say that you are for inclusivity and diversity and all of that and blindly follow the data from their ad response. I mean, there, of course you need to do things that say, okay, well, you know, right now people are responding to these ads, so we need to do some of this. But if you say that you stand for diversity and inclusion, then you need to be doing things that go against the short-term response rates so that you are creating a long-term path for those response rates to respond to something different. Yep. It's also, yeah, it's not, it's not one piece of content out of every 10 and you're just trying out the odd diverse ad. Like your, your actual buy needs to be maintained, not buy your, your total content output needs to become diverse. It needs to become what you want it to be. Um, and it's not, it's not a B testing, you know, uh, also when you make more diverse content, you make more real content, you're actually forced to make better content, I think. And we also need to look at who is making our content. Um, and we've, you know, this is a problem that's come up in advertising a huge amount over, over the last decade. And some advertising agencies have really stepped up. Some brands have stepped up and they've called for more diverse creative teams to be making the content as well. And I think that might be some of what we're seeing is that maybe sometimes content doesn't test as well when we try and make it diverse because the, the heavy handed nature of us trying to do that can be seen. Um, and it needs to feel authentic. It can't just be overnight, all of a sudden, you're going to change all of your content. You know, if you've been using, you know, skinny Caucasian models for a long time, you can't just, you know, one day turn it into, you know, United Colors of Benetton um, or different diverse body shapes. 
You yeah. have to actually sit down and decide, as Tamsin said, who you want to be as a brand, what you want to do, but you can't just fall back on numbers and say, hey, it's, you know, it's always worked this way. Let's keep it this way. You've got to look at who's making your content. As yeah, well. for, for me, uh, that's yeah. the bigger problem. For me, that is the bigger problem. It's not so much that it's not so much that the brands are making a conscious decision to work with um, with skinny white blonde models, you know, in terms of their influencer campaigns, it's more from the standpoint of who's doing the ads, who's doing the deals, who are these people making these skinny decisions? Skinny white blonde people. Skinny I mean, white blonde thing. people I mean, are making the these last, decisions. I mean, like anytime, generally, you walk into an advertising agency, you're yeah. going to see A, young, B, typically white, I don't know about the blonde piece, but you know, the, but that's, that's what you see. I mean, that's, this is, it's crazy. I mean, like, you know, when I was in an advertising agency, it was a conscious choice. I mean, it, they actively were trying to get it, folks that were different and that reflected that, but it's, it's back to the, you know, the, the natural biases of humans. You, you are going to pursue what looks like you, whether or not you like it or not. And so if we're talking about a much, you know, if we're talking about like the deep roots of systemic you know, bias and in, in, in implicit bias and in, in influencer marketing. I think you're right, Bob. We have to look at like who's in the advertising agency. And we've got to look, we've got to look by department. Who's in these positions and these brands? We've got to look by department as well because it's just like I think the advertising agencies have done a fairly good job of trying to diversify their creative departments because the creative for advertising is getting more and more diverse in a ref direct reflection and direct response to the diversification within the creative department. But when you go to the account side, you still have a sea of white people. And I think that you know, decisions on influencer marketing are not being made by creative folks. They're being made by the brand folks. They're being made by the ad executives. They're being made by PR executives. And in those industries, you have an enormous diversity problem that still needs to be addressed. And I think that that's possibly the bigger problem. I mean, wouldn't you say, Thompson? Yeah, it, I mean, absolutely, yes. Uh, and if you decided that who you are as a brand and that, that and you want to be consistent and aligned with that is to make those different choices, even if your even if your departments are are not diverse and inclusive, then you need to go find ways to bring that in for these significant conversations. I mean, I just we will always default to what is the easier answer as humans. And the easier answer is not to do it. But that's where I challenge brands, challenge advertising agencies, challenge influencers and all of the folks that are out there to say, if you say that you are for this thing, then you need to be taking steps to be for that thing all the way through, whatever that means. And if you don't, then it's right for people to question what your actual commitment is to it. And you're right, Bob, to bring up that it's sort of a chicken and egg thing in, in a lot of ways, right? I mean, for, you know, I, I've worked for 20 years with public media clients and public media clients deal with this all the time. But, you know, for, for 20 years, every single public media client I've had has been trying to solve the problem. How do we make our audience more diverse? How do we make our audience less white? Uh, and so you can you can address that in some ways in programming The the variable uh, the single strongest variable for in terms of correlation with public media listening, it's not ethnicity, it's education. And like, that's something that, you know, public media can, it can take steps and is taking steps, but it's, it's also comes down to the, uh, the education level of its audience and that's a systemic bias. And so, you know, it, it's not a simple problem. And certainly in the case of public media, they do take steps to try to solve it, but it's a supply and demand issue. And I'm very conscious, uh, as I always am on this show, that none of us are a people of color, which is another problem within the industry. It's just like, you know, I feel like because the industry has such poor representation of people of any kind of different ethnicity other than white Caucasian, you know, um, you know it, it just becomes so difficult to book guests on the show and diversify the show because these few people who are in positions of power and have establish themselves are being over asked to be on way too many programs and it's just like I, I i struggle with that because it's just like i wish that we could have a more diverse show and it's just like and i i look at the problem more deeply and it looks like the industry has the problem and it's just like it's not for lack of trying it's it's lack of lack of resources i guess but i don't know i mean it's just like i'll continue it to might, reach out 
it might be the ad industry as well playing catch up because I have seen a lot of brands and I don't know if they've got agencies or not. I will say, I mean, obviously like um, Fenty, Savage X Fenty does, but um, you know, there are a lot of other smaller brands that I see advertise on Facebook. Um, I spend a lot of way too much time on Facebook, um, but, uh, and they do have really diverse representation, body sizes, genders, races, um, in their advertising and it, they don't feel like ads as much to me. They don't feel like ad agency produced ads. So I'm starting to see more of that content in my own networks and in my own feed. And that's been really surprising and really good. And then reading about it in the likes of ad week or campaign, you know, we make uh, almost like a bigger deal out of it on in advertising. And I'd, I'd like to, look deeper into the brands that are just doing it naturally. These, the people who are going direct to consumer, um, a lot of direct to consumer brands. And it just seems like a no brainer. Like if you were starting something out now, why would you only pick, you know, size, you know, four models to be in your ads? That's not how your friends group or your family group is represented. So I think that a lot of brands that are starting, especially direct to consumer brands are doing things in a, in a sort of a, a more natural way. Um, and I think we need to slightly get over ourselves and not, not overly think it in advertising and just, well, we do need to overly think it because we need to undo a lot of inherent bias over the years. But I think we can also look to, to brands that are doing it right. Um, I, I and there still, are a lot of challenges, smaller brands who I think are, I and, still and miss, really interesting. I still miss the, uh, Instagram account out to lunch. It was done by two ad creatives. It was wonderful. She, uh, one of the women was tall and thin. The other one was shorter. Um, and it's yes, just like, and they wore the same outfit. They wore the same great. outfit. They would go out to oh, lunch. They great. would go dress up in the yeah. same outfit and they take pictures of each other, holding each other's hand. And it was just such a wonderful account. It never really caught on, but it was one of my favorite accounts. And I think that it's it's high time advertisers looked at that kind of opportunity and saw that, you know, there is a way to produce really great content showing different body types and make it more compelling than the Instagram model who's thin, white, blonde, and, you know, frolicking on a beach. I mean, I think there's... Because it's real. Right. Because it's real yeah. content. Right. You've got to look right. at what people are actually producing and organically following, you know? And these smaller challenger brands have small ad buys. They don't have big production budgets. Um, and maybe we could take a leaf out of their book and do, you know, the next time we're doing a, you know, a new positioning for Nike or something like that. Look at what, you know, the tiny, the tiny little, uh, you know, creator or manufacturer is doing um, and see how they're getting through to real people as well. Yeah. You know? right. And at some point, someone will do something like that and it will become a big hit. And then because it's a business of lemmings, everyone else will go right down the same path. I remember how fashion works. It starts at the street and it come and it comes up. And so, I mean, one does have hope that there are those people, but I think, you know, Alan's right. It's, it's going to, it's, it's going to take at the, at the large brand and the large advertising agency level, because those are big boats and they take a long time to turn. It's going to take, you know, kind of attack an attack, you know, from the side, you know, from the flank by something that they didn't see coming. Um, but I, I, I think Michelle is absolutely right. The, pay attention to what those small brands are doing because that's their best choice. And they have found that it's the best way to connect with the widest group of people. Um, and anybody who isn't, who isn't really seeing that or isn't consciously thinking about that is really opening themselves up to some major damage. And, and, and I mean, the ad industry and advertising agencies, they got enough problems. I, you know, I know that the, the, the instinct would be to kind of pull back, retreat, rely on what works, but doing that is going to be the thing that actually sinks them long term. Well, moving on, we, we call it derogatory names like the ad tax. This, of course, refers to the 30 percent of programmatic ad spend that goes to intermediaries who broker the deals between buy side and the sell side. Now, with the conventional wisdom here is that if we could eliminate intermediaries, buyers would save millions, sellers would earn millions more. But an opinion piece by Ben Feldman on Adweek takes a position that is uh, that this type of move would be a waste of effort, considering we can't even agree what constitutes an intermediary, and it ignores the fact that ad exchanges are still a vital part of making the programmatic universe work. It's a complicated topic, Michelle, but what are your thoughts on the infighting over programmatic intermediaries, and is it a fruitful discussion, or is it just a distraction to focus all this attention on getting rid of the the exchanges out there. 
Okay, so I tried to make you change this topic when I first received it because I am it's sort of quite it's probably the topic furthest away from what I do on a day-to-day basis and like immersive technology and, and strategy around the pro- programmatic and media. And then I read the article. The article is actually very well written. Um, I really appreciate it. it. It, you know, answers some questions, um, but also, you know, uh, um, asks a lot of questions. I think it's a, it's a really great article. Everyone should, should read it, check it out on, on ad week. But, um, so I really had to dig deep on this and I'm glad I did because I I have a better understanding of it now. So it seems to be that the, um, the, you know, this kind of boils down to do intermediaries add value to the transaction. And regardless of the hyperbole around the conversation, the questions, the, the, you know, the issues with it, that's what it boils down to. Um, are they are these people in between adding value? And and you've got to remember that intermediaries also include us. They include ad agencies. They include ad tech platforms. They include data providers. You know, they're all lumped into that that those intermediary um, transactions. <clears throat> so, um, I looked uh, sort of and immediately. I thought, well, what other industry has this been happening to? Where we start to question intermediaries, right? And I think we're all quite familiar over the last decade that we've seen, you know, intermediaries be taken out of the conversation or being taken out of the equation um, in things like, uh, you know, taxi industry, um, real estate brokers, uh, trucking brokers, actually have done some cool research projects in trucking where brokers are being taken out, the intermediaries, insurance brokers, financial brokers, mostly all brokers, um, you know, that's sort of the definition of intermediaries. And those the, the destruction of intermediaries, or at least the questioning of intermediaries in some of those other industries has not always gone smoothly. So, you know, having a look a little bit deeper in this um, was really interesting. And I've got some some sort of some tips for where we go next. But um, the author of the Adweek article um, actually pointed out that smart contracts, you know, so, so making sure that every transaction along the way is recorded, sort of underpinned by, um, you know, the infallible uh, blockchain. Um, you know, is one one answer to this. Uh, and then there was a really interesting Digiday article as well that I read uh, that b- basically has this quote in it. it. It says about these two new technologies that have been brought in to, to try and uh, help with transparency that they can be used, buyers can use them to match seller IDs given by publishers and the ads.txt files uh, to this to these new um, you know supply chain objects and things they're being they're being asked to to use and decide whether or not they're bona fide partners so they're basically saying hey we're going out there and putting all the information out there so you as a buyer can actually sit down and track it all which is ridiculous because that's not that you know that that's not um it's not helping in that case. It's basically saying, hey, we've done our job a little bit, but we're going to leave it up to you to track down and make sure everything is, you know, is matching up. Um, and so there are some steps I think we should take here. So um, clients, I think, buyers need to take more uh, more proactive role in ad transparency. So I think, uh, you know, the, the big brands um, should not be perhaps relying on their media agencies as much, or they can still rely on them, but it should be more of a relationship And they need to have, um, beyond just cost consultants on the brand side, they need to have analysts. And I'm I'm sure that many of them already do, but I think that they need to dig deep and make certain demands, but but realistic demands, not just cost demands of media agencies and ad agencies and ultimately publishers and, and the intermediaries and say, hey, we understand what's going on here, or at least we're trying to. Um, you know, this is what we want you to do in aid of transparency for us. We understand that certain intermediaries can add value, um, but, you know, we want to we want to track it. They need to take more ownership of it, I think, rather than just, you know, relying on reports that say where money is wasted and trying to do it perhaps themselves. Um, I think that uh, more parties, this is a again, ringing true, third topic of the day, um, more parties need to take a vested interest in regulation um, and like a serious active role in regulation. And then at the end of the day, I think we really need to ask ourselves whether these systems need to be rebuilt. You know, um, like the Adweek article mentions blockchain, other things like that. Do they need to be rebuilt? Do we need to have a serious uh, shakeup and, and a look at this? And if we decide that they do, I think the reason they probably haven't is because that costs money, right? So people at the end of the day are going to have to pull out wallets and maybe stop whining as much and say, hey, if there needs to be meaningful change here, people are going to have to pay and people from all sides, not just the ad tech platforms, not just the publishers, the buyers as well. Because we want this to be a better system. Everybody's going to have to come together and try and make it a better system. 
So um, I think it's I think there's a lot of hyperbole. Um, I don't think it's a particularly helpful discussion to to look at you know get granular about where money is being wasted. I think it's a bigger picture uh, sort of you know discussion that needs to be had about if it's not good enough, let's change it, which seems to be the answer to everything today. <laughs> so, yeah. For someone who knows nothing about this subject, you sure as hell covered it really really well. Um, I mean. I want to play devil's advocate, though, for a second. Um, One of the big complaints about uh, programmatic advertising as a whole is that it just creates so much noise online. You've got this ability to scale very, very quickly and very, very easily a campaign that stretches far and wide across the Internet. And you just put in parameters and you don't know where your ads are actually going. Um, You have some idea of where they're going, but you don't actually have control of your campaign. And for me, you know, simplifying the entire process down to, okay, I know who I'm buying from. I'm going to put it in a bid for this exchange for these particular publications, and I'm going to know whether or not I got through. That kind of relationship takes more ownership of where your ads Mm -hmm. are going. And it's not as efficient, and it's not as fast, and it's not as easy as doing it programmatically across an exchange that goes far and wide. But it does take more of an ethical approach to advertising. It's something that's, you know, solving some of the problems we talked about earlier, which is that advertising has no ethics. We just, you know, blast out our ads and, you know, the torpedoes be damned. We're just going, you know? Yeah, I think that... um... I think what you said there is, is it hits the nail on the head about ownership. You know, you've got to decide, well, it, okay, the, the topic sort of was initially raised, um, you know, in reference to money, right? We're hemorrhaging money. There are some sort of dark transactions or shady transactions happening along the way. Uh, more people just trying to get in on it and, you know, take their 0.0003 cents everywhere they can. Um, but you, you raise a new point, which is uh, it's not just about the money that's being leaked, potentially. It's also about not knowing where your advertising turns up. Uh, and that's a really interesting point as well, because if your ads are hitting home, if they are actually working for you, if they are optimized, um, you know, they, they should be in line with your, with your ethics as well, presumably. Um, you're not just getting cheap buys on, on random sites. You don't really even know where it's coming from. Not cheap buys, cheap impressions. Um, but again, it takes ownership. It takes more ownership. I think that for too long, we have relied on our media agencies a little too heavily, and I'm not undermining media agencies. I mean, we're, we're all questionable, every single ad agency in the whole industry, um, you know, as much as media agencies, as much as anyone else. Um, but there are so many more players now than there used to be. There are more intermediaries, and some of them, because they've made our our ad buys more optimized, um, and they have given more transparency, ironically. More intermediaries have helped with more transparency. Um, but if we want to clean this up, uh, I think that the buyers themselves, and by that I mean the, ultimately the brand, needs to take a closer look and be more involved in in not only dictating the rules, um, but also, you know, the optimization and the tracking themselves. Not Not to say that they should take the role of the media agency, but they should be more involved. Anybody else want to jump in on this one? <laughs> well, I think any, any, oh, sorry. Go on. Uh, as, I mean, any kind of disruptive tech, ad tech or, or otherwise, starts off by attacking efficiencies and then moves on to effectiveness, right? And it's easy to go back and say the Internet has not been kind to intermediaries and middle persons. And you can go back even 20 years to things like, uh, you know, realtors and, and uh, travel agents and stockbrokers and things like that. But, you know, what happens is first you attack the efficiencies and then the inefficient things go away. And then gradually, though, there is a class of intermediary that becomes very, very valuable. And those are the ones that add genuine effectiveness and genuine value to the transaction. And I think we saw that uh, with you know, Facebook ads five or six years ago were one weird trick to fix your mortgage. And now I'm buying between one and three travel backpacks a week because they have freaking nailed me. Uh, and I just think that the same thing is going to happen with programmatic. Programmatic at first is, you know, has been sort of the, uh, the, the provenance of remnant business in a lot of places as we've just gone for efficiencies. But at some point, the intermediaries that survive are going to be the ones that uh, that have mastered targeting so effectively that they genuinely add value to the transaction. So I don't think the internet, the internet never completely uh, decimates isn't the right word. I guess it's decimates 
uh, intermediaries. But uh, the but there will be a strong class that survive, and they genuinely add value to the transaction. Yeah, I mean, it's not, not really about, about like, oh. well, it's not really about intermediaries. Though. So the the argument, because we do some work with blockchain companies, the argument is that when all of this internet advertising started, the the you know the publishers were not prepared for all the stuff that they needed to be prepared for all this measurement data ad serving and so other companies sprung up to do this for them that were taking a piece out of it they technically should have been able to do themselves and that whether it's blockchain technology or something similar can come in and basically remove the need for a lot of these intermediaries who don't do all the magical things they basically just sort of check they verify they check on things they're all things that that either shouldn't need to be done in a fully transparent system or that the publisher should be able to do for themselves. And that's what a lot of people are saying, that a lot of those companies, it doesn't so much that they're value less, but that they, the need for them you know, was created by the fact that this all took everybody by surprise and nobody ever raised their hand and said, you know, we should probably just do this ourselves. Well, in a lot of ways, I mean, the whole thing is just the 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 ever present problem. You know, it's a principal agent problem always. And as long as you've got intermediaries intermediaries that are, you know, at the very least tempted and at the very most incentivized to serve their own interests over anything else, then you you're always going to have a problem. And so, you know, back to back to Michelle's point about the fact that you know this does require some regulation at some level in order to figure out what it is. But of course, you know. It, related to that is making sure we've got clear definitions on, on who are the principals and who are the agents and what roles do they actually need to play? Well, moving on to our last topic, because we're running out of time, so we don't have a whole lot of time on this one. But finally, the New York Times proclaims this week what many of us already know. People hate advertising. I, I know it's kind of hard to believe. The question, though, Alan, are the questions that I have, though, are, Alan, are do they hate all ads or do they just hate bad ads? And is this long-running negative sentiment getting worse? Why is this article coming out now after all this time that we've already known people hate ads? Um, I, I asked myself the same question. I think it was just, you know, the time sometimes is late catching up to trends. Um, <laughs> I think people people hate bad ads and most ads are bad um they've gotten worse i mean the fact that we allow pharma ads which are forced people to think about death and dying for 60 seconds and 40 seconds of which are you know are really about death and dying doesn't help and the fact that you know they take up so much of the advertising that's out there and that there's the ability to avoid ads i mean you know that we worry there's a something we call fifteen thousand merits it's it's named after the second episode of Black Mirror, where there's this world where you can pay, you basically pay. You're surrounded by advertising all the time, like walls turn into ads. But you can also pay merits or the currency in the thing, where you can pay to avoid advertising, and that's something that you can very easily see happening, where people who can afford it will pay for subscription services or ad-free services, and really be very rarely exposed to advertising where everybody else, I mean, if you look at some of the media in developing countries like India, it's, you know, the amount of advertising that's there is is just phenomenal because that, that's how it's it's subsidized in a country where people don't have a lot of money. And, you know, do we wind up with this two-tier system in the U.S.? In terms of the ad industry, I mean, all this stuff we were just talking about are programmatic and ads, you know, and irrelevant ads and all that, you know, yes, that's that's what people hate. Ads ads that show up in places you don't want to see ads, you know, network TV ad blocks that just keep getting bigger and bigger. And especially when you're coming from a Netflix with no ads, or even something like Hulu where the ad breaks are 90 seconds and that's it. You know, it just it's it's oppressive when you see it. And people just are like, no, I don't want this anymore. I'm, I'm gonna go away. Plus we now have other ways to monetize, whether it's via subscriptions, whether it's via product placements, you know, so so there's a lot of reason why advertising is, you know, is sort of in trouble. Um, I don't but to your point, Bob, I don't think it's new. I, I you know, it's it's been there for quite a while. Well, the one thing that I think is new about this though, and I I, I take your point uh completely about uh bad ads and, and good ads, but but our relationship with ads, period, is changing, and you you did hit it on the head with the reasons why. And we've actually 
uh, over the past couple of years, we've got a ton of research on this. Because okay. people's consideration sets are more and more likely to include streaming audio services like Pandora and Spotify that are either ad-free or ad-spartan, uh, streaming video services like Netflix, Amazon Prime, and Hulu, again, ad-free or ad-spartan at worst. You know, 70% of Americans now subscribe to a premium video service like Netflix or Hulu, 70%. Like mm. economically, that's almost all ashore who's going ashore. And what it functionally comes down to that's different today that was not true uh, six or seven years ago even is our willingness to subscribe to content, which, which was not true at this scale uh, even five or six years ago. And what the ad bargain is now, the ad bargain has fundamentally changed, right? If you really like Coke, then you either have the option of spending $10 to get a six-pack that is six cans of Coke, or you can get one for free that's four cans of Coke and two cans of RC. And 70% of Americans don't want the RC Cola. Like, they're spending the extra for the six-pack of Coke. And that's happening more and more. And because the consideration set people have, where whereby they are comparing now, so much of their media consumption is Netflix, Hulu, Satellite Radio, Pandora, Spotify, that like the consideration set between that and things like network TV and broadcast commercial radio, there is such a stark contrast between them now that I think it's not just the bad ads anymore. I think we do hate advertising even more than we ever did because we have so many mainstream outlets that avoid it. You know, I've always maintained that it's just the fact that there's too many ads going on at one time in your life. I mean, the fact that you're getting so many ad impressions every single day is really what drives people to hate advertising, or at least say that they hate advertising, because people still talk about ads. They still like certain ads. Um, and the other thing that comes to mind is how much of this, you know, is just wringing of hands about the existential threat of what Generation Z is going to be doing once they come of age and once they start actually taking over the world. I mean, right now, they don't, use, they don't, they don't watch any ads. They're, they don't care about ads. They do everything to avoid ads. They're very skeptical of ads. How much of that is just because they're young and how much of that is going to continue with them throughout their life as they get older? You know, I've always said, mm. you know, one uh, millennials are just one minivan away from becoming like the rest of us. And mostly that's been true. But I think that there is an existential feeling that somehow this next generation coming up is somehow worse, that somehow this is going to be the tipping point where people yeah. just don't accept ads. Has well, I mean, every the, generation it's, thought that about yes. the other generation? I mean, yeah. it's just like, you know, yeah. I mean... Well, that's why I'm saying, is it how much <laughs> of it is uh, just mean, because they're they young and how much... They radio star. <laughs> right, how much is... They buy yeah, they stuff do. off of Instagram all the time, and that's really yeah. targeted. I mean, the hope with television is that as, you know, as, we, as we move to advanced TV and data-driven... You know, advertise that we we will wind up. The holy grail is fewer, better targeted ads that viewers don't mind watching, and brands will pay more money for. So it's sort of what you have with Hulu now. We are able to have. You had a great word for it, Bob. I'm sorry, I just I just forgot. Um, for ad light, but um, but yeah, we we have a you have far fewer ads. They're not as intrusive or interruptive, and I also think we're going to start seeing value return to creative. That brands are going to start realizing, okay. We figured out how to get people where we want them, but if we don't show them something they like, it doesn't matter. So now we've got to take that next step and actually show them good ads. I think it comes down to whether or not you believe not advertising is like uh, smoking, like the acceptance of advertising is like smoking. If you don't do it at a young age, you're not going to pick it up when you're 30. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, that's that's not true. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but um, also, like Gen Gen Z are watching ads. They're just not watching ads that we used to watch. No, they're so watching they're white. They're watching skinny white still... models on beaches oh, frolicking stop, around. Stop, stop, stop. No, they're, they're not. They're, they're watching, watching ads they're for like watching their friends, <laughs> and just... they're watching the the influencers, the young people who are making content that is ad backed. And this is one of the weird things because I've had this really uneasy feeling for a few years now that ads are changing so much that soon we won't recognize them. And that's the sort of the move into editorial and a lot of things like that. It's not just paid advertising anymore as we know it. Gen Z is not watching the kind of ads that we watched. 
and they're watching paid content though. Um, my nephew is six and he watches unboxing videos on YouTube. That's all paid content. Most YouTube channels that people watch are paid content. They're ad supported or they are brand supported, sponsor supported. And mm -hmm. when I started working in a bit of influencer marketing a few years ago before I kind of pivoted straight into immersive tech, <laughs> I guess I'm like, that's not my world. Um, it was really interesting that the the teams that I was working with are saying, you know what, the million followers that are following these like younger, younger people who are making daily content, they get over the fact that it's ad sponsored because they want to see this person every day. They want to see their life. They want to see what they put out and they put up with the fact that it's brought to you by loot box or something, you know, like they, they put up with this. So um, either they recognize it or worse, maybe they're not recognizing that it's actually advertising. And I think that's a problem we have to, to start talking about as well. But I think ads have changed for Gen Z for sure. Right. And you have Amazon too. look at, look, I mean, we, we talk about that a lot that Amazon could very easily say, you know, we're, we're not going to sell actual ads. Um, if you are, you know, for our NFL games, if you want to buy something, we'll just put it at the top. You know, we know who watched the game. And the next time they go on Amazon, we'll put an ad for, you know, we'll put something on their feed, you know, an ad for your product. Or we'll put your product top, if, you know, and we'll put something that says sponsored on it. But we don't need to actually interrupt them while they're watching. And, you know. Amazon's got more data on everyone than, you know, and, and real data too. They know what they bought, not what they just hit liked on. So, well, with that, I don't, think, I don't think people hate advertising as much as we think. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, irrelevant I, advertising. And again, I think that's yeah. that's that's the piece of it. You know, it's I think mm -hmm. you know we can look at famously bad ads that are actually great because they're exactly what you're looking for. I mean, I think that's that's the piece. It's just I think all of this hand wringing about advertising and bad ads and is you know Gen Z going to? I mean, it's just it's brands facing the harsh fact that the entire world is not in fact their audience. And so, and that they can't be lazy about treating them as if every single person in their audience is exactly the same. And so the people that are going to win and the ones that are winning right now are the ones that actually understand at a deep level, who are their audience? What do they stand for? How do, what do their audience stands for? What they stand for align? And what's the best way that the, their audience wants to find out, wants to hear about what they have to offer. And that's hard work. And brands don't like generally like doing that hard work. And as a counterpoint to that, and, you know, we've um, got to end know, the show say, sometime people, tonight. People, <laughs> people, people will say, you know, the, the television industry's biggest argument for, you know, for advertising versus digital is people remember ads they saw when they were children. They remember ads they saw 10 years ago. They don't remember banner ads they saw 10 minutes ago, um, and which is why I think that you know, the, a, a return to creativity is in the air that brands are not realizing, okay, we, we need to make stuff that people are going to remember 10 years from now, because that, that has an incredible amount of value for us. Okay, now it's time for this week's Fair, Fail, Foul. But before we get to that segment of the show, I do want to take this quick opportunity to thank my guests again and allow them to each do a shameless plug, starting with Michelle Excel. You can find her at theantipodean.us. Uh, tell us what's going on in your world, Michelle. What would you like to promote? So um, in the last month, uh, actually, I've been in a few different places running workshops. So um, ran a, a workshop at Spikes Asia in Singapore, um, all about extended reality and the advertising industry and what we need to do to give ourselves a kick up the bum and understand its value and work with our clients um, with uh, the inimitable Emily Binder, who I met on this podcast. Uh, shout out to Beetle uh, moment and her marketing agency, which is fantastic. Um, she brought me along to run a workshop at a wealth management uh, conference and we did it all on voice, um, which was fantastic. So I would uh, just like to put out there if you are wanting to know about augmented reality or virtual reality or voice or IOT and just what it means in terms of your brand or your industry or vertical, your ad agency, um, give me a call. I, I run workshops uh, to, to break the ice and get you pointed in the right direction. Okay, next up we have Tamsin Webster. You can find her at TamsinWebster.com. What's going on in your world, Tamsin? What do you want to promote? Well, just uh, thinking through all of these different elements of how do you find and connect with your message and your audience at, the, at, the, at that right intersection. So I think the best thing for folks to want to know more about that and work on kind of making their ideas strong enough to build change on 
uh, I would say send them to my newsletter. Easiest way to find that is bit.ly link. So bit.ly slash red thread reading, capital R, capital T, capital R. That sounds succinct. <laughs> uh, next up, we've got Tom Webster. Tom, you can find him at edisonresearch.com. Uh, what are you going to promote today, Tom? So uh, next Tuesday, the 12th, we have uh, the first ever comprehensive study of the spoken word universe coming out in partnership with NPR. Uh, it's, the study is going to look at all aspects of the, of the current renaissance, or as some might say, renaissance of spoken word audio, audiobooks, smart speakers, podcasting, the entire universe and how, uh, how that's affected the share of ear, the percentage of time we spend listening to music versus speech has changed over the last five years. So we're going to do a comprehensive webinar on that for free on the 12th, and you can register for that at edisonresearch.com. And finally, Mr. Alan Walk, you can find him at tvrev.com. That's the home of his blog and consultancy and all kinds of great content on the TV industry. Tell us what's going on in your world. What would you like to promote, Alan? Okay, so we have a big report, a big special report on addressable TV advertising that's coming out this month, and you can buy it at our website at tvrev.com. It really goes into everything you need to know about addressable how it's bought, how it's sold, what our predictions are. We talk to about 100 people in the industry, brands, agencies, TV networks, all off the record, and then compile this report. Um, and then we also do education around that, boot camps, seminars, things like that for brands, for agencies, for networks. Um, we work with all the big ones. Um, and then I'm going to be on Cheddar TV tomorrow. I am a regular guest on there talking about the streaming wars. So that's at 1020 a.m. tomorrow, Monday, November 3rd, November 4th. Awesome. November 3rd. Awesome. And I want to say the guests tonight have been phenomenal. If you all were out there, you, you know, clapping your hands, you should be clapping your hands because this was a phenomenal panel. Thank you so much for participating. As for me, for more information about me or the show, visit thebeancast.com. There you can find a complete show archive, how to consult with me, and even how to, uh, how to advertise on this program. So check it all out at thebeancast.com. And now it's time for the Fair, Fail, Foul, a rundown of the best and worst of advertising, marketing, and public relations from the last week. And of course, on this very long episode, I've chosen to do two fairs tonight because I couldn't choose between the two of them. First up, uh, first fair, Chick-fil-A's fail is Popeye's fair. The former Chick-fil-A sent out an email touting that they would be celebrating National Sandwich Day on November 3rd, only to issue a retraction when someone checked a calendar and saw that National Sandwich Day falls on Sunday this year, which the chain is famously closed on. So Popeye's went into full-on troll mode, Tom, with a promotion that relaunches their viral chicken sandwich and with a commercial that emphasizes they, unlike their competition, are indeed open on Sundays. I love this video. It is such a simple idea, but it's so effective. You know, the typical road sign where Chick-fil-A says close Sunday and somebody's putting up letters underneath the Popeye saying open Sunday. Um, it just says it all, and it's such an effective ad. What do yeah, you but, you know, in the words of Tom Waits, that is cream puff Casper milk toast trolling. I mean, the, <laughs> like, honestly— like, let's go ahead and steer into this. Let's start a brand that just steers right into the face of Chick-fil-A, Satan Shack. Like, <laughs> we're only open on Sundays, and we're back. <laughs> Which may be Popeyes. I'm not really sure. Uh, their sandwiches are pretty greasy. Shack. Satan Shack. No, also. <laughs> I can't get past that. I think we got a title show. Show title. There we go. Uh, dyslexic here. All right. Also fair this week, the president getting booed wasn't the only highlight of Game 5 of the World Series. A man returning to his seat at this... Uh, uh, sorry. A man returning at his, to his seat while carrying two cans of Bud Light stopped a home run ball with his chest without spilling a drop and then even managed to retrieve the ball when he was done, which was just icing on the cake. Alan... Bud Light obviously took notice, and they did an awesome job of capitalizing on the viral moment. What's your opinion about the way this all went down? They, they, they found the guy. They gave him ga tickets to the next game. They gave him a T-shirt that showed a picture of him having the ball hit off his chest. I think this was just brilliant marketing 
uh, one of the few times I'm I'm completely on board with real time marketing. Oh, I agree with you 100%. Plus, I'm sure he was thrilled, right? Like, I'm sure he was like, yo, he did this cool thing. Some of you, they picked up on it. He got his 15 minutes. So I think everybody won. I think so. Now, in the fail category for this week, uh, McDonald's Portugal ran a Halloween ad promoting their ice cream sundae with the headline, Sunday Bloody Sunday which stirred up a bit of outrage, Michelle, considering they co-opted an event from the Troubles in Northern Ireland. I love how they call it the Troubles, this deadly war that raged on in Northern Ireland for so many years. Um, the Troubles in Northern Ireland that saw 13 people shot dead by British troops. Um, I'm not sure whether or not I'm thinking the brand completely failed with this or this is just the outrage machine going nuts or whether no, or not it... this is no this isn't the outrage machine this is this is totally outrageous like this is i don't i don't know was it some probably somebody on the younger side who doesn't actually understand or remember the ramifications from this i find it really difficult in america um this this drink that you get in bars here that americans call a, like an irish car bomb i find that highly offensive this is just off the charts no no not I've the never outrage even machine. heard of real that outrage. Wow. that's for real I've never oh no! That. Absolutely, it's in like all pubs here. It's a, I think it's a, it's a shot in a Guinness. It's like a something oh like God. that Irish car bomb, and I, it's, horrible. it's like nails on a chalkboard. And it's, I've heard it, uh, New York, San Francisco, L.A., everywhere, and that would well, never it's fly. Well, cities, else, you know, so, yeah. they're the worst yeah. part. It's the cities. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> trying to figure out. Inland. Yeah. I'm still trying <laughs> yeah. to figure out why, even if it, even if the only reference was to a U2 album, why that was a good headline for a Sunday promotion. Oh, it was yeah, a it Halloween, was Halloween, promotion. Halloween, <laughs> Halloween promotion. Oh, yeah, Halloween. Yeah, Halloween. Oh, oh. That's okay. Satan no, Shack. That's <laughs> Never mind. That belongs at Satan Shack. It absolutely belongs at Satan Shack. Yeah. Da 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 da. We're killing you. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, on the foul for this week, Aaron Sorkin penned a treatise against Facebook's stance on political ads this past Thursday in the New York Times, calling it an assault on truth. So Mark Zuckerberg, in a rare move for him, actually shot back with Sorkin's own words about free speech, quoting the film The American President. And I'll read this. America isn't easy. America is advanced citizenship. You got to want it bad because it's going to put up a fight. It's going to say you want free speech. Let's see you acknowledge a man whose words make you bloody bo your blood boil, who's standing center stage and advocating at the top of his lungs that which you would spend a lifetime opposing at the top of yours. Um, it was pretty, pretty good shot back. And it's well, kind of a burn. Yeah. Sick burn. <laughs> Uh, Tamsin, what do you think? <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, it's it, like it's a pretty sick burn, and it's <laughs> it's just a kind of a great uh, a, a great proof point on the fact that you know, live as everything you do will eventually be known. And when you're a writer and you take a pot shot at Mark Zuckerberg with an entire movie, and then you put an op-ed in the in the Times, it, it, it's fair, I think, for said pot shot tea to use your own words against you. Yeah. There used to be this uh, awesome basic language program on computers called Eliza that was uh, that purported to be a psychiatrist. That basically you you would put in a a prompt and say something like uh, I really don't like my mother and it would just it would come back to you with something like how do you feel about I really don't like my mother. <laughs> and that's the level of sentience that Zuckerberg has shown with this particular <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure he would pass the Turing test if you just slid a piece yeah. of paper under a door. Well, have a suggestion for this list or just want to discuss it, comment online. Use the hashtag pound fair fail foul. That's pound fair fail foul. And that does it for this week's show. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, visit our website at thebeancast.com and click on the subscribe link. If you're an Apple Podcast listener, we've also provided a direct link to our listing there. Or just search for The Beancast in the podcast directory on the Apple Podcasts app. And whichever podcast directory you use, when you subscribe, please leave us a review. Got a comment? Have a question? We'd love to hear from you. Just send your emails to beancast at gmail.com. Opening theme was performed by Joe Seibel. Closing theme by C. Jax. Thanks for listening. I'm Bob Norp. We'll be back again next week. Hope you'll join us then. You know what I mean?
it's like, it's like, like if it's, you know what I mean? Um, I don't know, man. Just like, okay, it's like, um, you know what I mean? Like, it's like totally like that. It's like, uh, it's like, it's like, I don't know. Like if it's, you know, it's like, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just like kind of. It just seems like it's just like almost exactly.